this is a home interview, Geneva, New York. It is the 25th of August, 2005, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Anthony Henry Visco. I was born 4 -13 And where? In Geneva. Geneva, okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, about the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where you were and how you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was working at the U.S. Depot at the time. And I thought it was horrible and I wanted to volunteer. My father says, no way. Mm -hmm. If he wants you, that's come and get you. So. so were you drafted or did you enlist? I, no, he only me he only so me volunteer. Drafted. Okay. I was drafted. I had to wait until I was 21. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, uh, I see you went to Fort Niagara. Was that the yeah. induction center? Or yeah. How long we, were you there? We went there by bus. I think it was one day overnight, like. Mm -hmm. Went from there, went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, how long were you at Bragg? So we got there. September 42. I think we left there in 40, fall of 43. Could went you tell Camp, us? We went to Camp Shanks, New York. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about your training while you were at Fort Bragg? It was hell. <laughs> I, I, mean, I came for you because the first night we went out to bivouac. Holy sh we never got a chance to put our tennis up and rain like hell. Dear God, what the hell am I doing here? Really? Uh -huh. It was terrible. Yeah. But we lived through it, and we got accustomed to that kind of living. Was this your first time really away from home? Yeah. But it was nice after a while when you got accustomed to the routine, you know. But it wasn't very nice, especially rain like a son of a bee. You're soaking wet and you're putting your tent in the Christ, you gotta sleep in wet clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we had a lot of rest and while we were training, you couldn't walk no place. If you went to the for chow, you ran the chow. If you went to the church, you ran the church. You always had to run, no walking. So we used to walk every morning, I don't know, we used to go five miles every day, I think, hiking. Mm -hmm. We used to have forced marches, like 25, 30 miles, forced march with full packs and stuff like that. Then you'd go through these obstacle courses and when you come back, and sometimes it's guys would throw their butts on the ground and they find out they're all a mess. We'd have to go back and feel stripping. And you hear a lot of bitching and complaining. <laughs> Now, when were you assigned to the uh, airborne units? Right, right there. away. Yeah. Okay, so you went there. That's knowing... where it, that's where it started. Yes, yeah, so right. You knew right away then when you went to Bragg that you were in an airborne unit. No, we volunteered. When we got there. Oh, okay. They looked for volunteers. Mm -hmm. Now, why did you decide to volunteer? Fifty bucks. Okay. Fifty bucks extra, Christ! No, we paid sixty-nine dollars a month. So fifty bucks a lot of money then. Mm -hmm. That would be your jump pay. For flight pay, yeah. Uh -huh. Could you tell us about your training as a uh, paratrooper? Well, it was, it, it was hard, but it was, they had prepared for in the beginning. You say, well, these guys are crazy, you know, the calisthenics and things you had to go through. But it was physical and building your body up to me. And it was for a good purpose, because... They're building your body up so you can withstand all this crap we had to take. And it did come in handy, it really did. Mm -hmm. How many jumps did you make at school? No, I didn't jump, I was with the gliders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we had quite a few of them before we went home, mm -hmm. invasion of Normandy. Did you have uh, much glider, glider training? Yes, we did. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, we was, uh, Temple Air, Air Force, they had a base right there in Fort Bragg. 
and we'd go up there, and the pilot was good. He could stop that damn thing. He put a handkerchief out there in the field with our glider, and he could stop that no problem at all. But when we went over sea, then we flew invasion of Norway with those horse gliders, the big old English gliders. They were terrible. And then we had to land that big old thing in a small field. Oh, shit. With no way. They had crashed right through the hedgerows. Mm -hmm. The wings had been back here, the fuselage would go through, and the tails would be back here. Guys would hang on them and everything else. So when you went into Normandy, you used the horse of the horse run. Yeah. They are a big old box, yeah. a big old box car. So big, clumsy thing. So, so uh, yours crash landed too yeah. in Normandy. Well, very fortunate. Was anyone seriously injured? Oh yeah, a lot of got killed. No, I mean, not, not, not in mine, no. Okay. no. We were very lucky. It was funny, we, when we were flying over the channel, this friend of ours, Joe Georgenbach, he's from Buffalo, he's playing the harmonica and the guys are singing. Nobody's thinking about nothing. All at once we see the pilot put on a flight jacket. So we look out the window, Christ, here's a kind of flak all around us, you know. Boy, you hear a pin drop. Nobody's singing no more, nothing. And everybody start praying. Mm -hmm. But like again, we were in a fortune we didn't get shot down. I don't know how they missed us. That's the guy. There's flak all around us. Mm -hmm. Then we land that stupid little field. Especially there, there was all hedgerows. And they're so small for a big horse or glider like that to land. Mm -hmm. So you don't think the you were trained for that kind of landing then, a, a small field? Yeah, but not with that horse or glider. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back a little bit. How, when did you eventually go overseas? In the fall of... Uh, 43. Mm -hmm. Now that you went by uh, a convoy? Yeah, well, that's another story. As we started off from New York, and we took off. The next morning we wake up, the sun is on the wrong side of the ship. And we're all alone. First we were with a bunch of, we had a big convoy. And crash here we are all alone. And I said, what the hell's going on? And I couldn't figure out all that. But then we found out later, something happened to the ship. We landed, we had to go back to Newfoundland, went to Newfoundland. And we were there for, I don't know, I can't remember how many days, quite a while. They fixed the ship. As they going out of Newfoundland, they hit bottom and they tore the front end of it. So we had to go back in again. And we had it took 75 days before we got to England. So we had to get another ship. And they had to go back to Halifax to get resupplied to take us to England. And we landed in Reading, England. It's right in the middle of Reading, this little city in England. I think it's about 30 some miles from London. So that's where we took our training. And that's when the 82nd came back to Mitley. And they needed to replace the real bag. And that's when our 3rd Battalion from the 101st joined the 82nd. And we, got, we moved from Reading to Leicester, England. And we lived in tents there. Mm -hmm. But when we were living in Reading, we had regular barracks there, but they had these beds that were made of strong mattresses. Holy shit, did we ever get in trouble? We got bit, my tiny my head, those goddamn mites and stuff. Mm -hmm. We got infected so bad we all wound up in the hospital for a couple of weeks to get cleared up. You had to take all your naked and the nurse would put that Sam on every day. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. So that's when we moved to Leicester and then. Got our training, more training there. And now, did you did you train in the horses there or? No, our gliders. 
So you basically was the first time you ever went in a horse that was on the in the landing. Yeah. Uh, it was something else, really. Now the the pilots that uh, brought you in, was that the first time they f had flown the horse? Do you know? No, I don't know. Okay. Just go ahead, if you don't mind, a little detail. Why did you prefer the American gliders over the Horsa? Oh, hell, I was nice and small. And you can land in any place. Mm -hmm. With a horse, you got to have a, like a football field. Do you know what kind of plane they towed them behind? C-47. C-47, okay. I get 155 miles, <laughs> like you're standing still. Uh, did you uh, get much, did you have much contact with the people of England while you were there? Oh yeah, I had this lady in England, uh, right in town. I got a crush of this elderly lady. We become close friends, we used to go to dog races and things like that, and her and her husband. She, she was like a, she ran like a cafeteria, and her husband was a postmaster at Reading. And every day when I was there at 4 o'clock, she'd come and holler, Tony, tea time! She'd bring a cup of tea and a cup of trumpets. <laughs> it was nice. I still drink tea. I love tea. Uh-huh. Did you keep in contact with them after the war? Yes. But she died. Her husband died first, and then she died. And I never heard from her daughter or her, or her son. Mm -hmm. I heard for a while, but then all at once I heard him once. Okay. For me, she died, I don't know. Yeah. That was a nice, clean little town, right? Did you ever get into London and see much of the bomb damage? Oh, and... yes. The Fogo Square, geez, they had millions of pigeons there. And, and they had a lot of places out in the open country where they had you swear to God at night, it was streets. They had these lights, little dim lights. It's fake. It's off set to bombers or Germans come over to bomb them. They see these lights, they, they drop all their bombs in that area. And well, hell, there ain't nothing there but just street lights. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. But they did raise hell in London, my God. But ain't nothing what they didn't do to Germany and, and places like Germany was terrible. Everything piled up by title. It's like a bad dream. Now, what kind of weapons were you trained with? M1 and 45s. Mm -hmm. okay, some, okay. some had bazooka, some had uh, BARs, machine, light machine guns, and stuff like that. Could you describe your I know you did a little bit. Could you describe the landing, the you know, taking off and the landing and so on? Well, we were fighting like I was first scout. Now when we got brief, we got to, when we landed. It says you wait for the man to come with the radio to find out where we got to go. Cause hell, I don't know how you land in the friggin' middle of the Germans. You don't know what we'll go this way or that way. We don't know where the hell the rendezvous is. Really? So this little tent said, okay, let's go take off. I take off. Bullshit. I said, I don't know where the hell to go. So I said, we got to wait for the man with the radio. So finally, the man did come with the radio. Thanks be to God, he did come. Because if I went, well, he told me to go, hell, I'm going to go the wrong way. So we did, and then we met with the rest of the troops and prayed to God that the guys came by land. We were to hurry up and catch up to us. Mm -hmm. We were surrounded, you know, right, right in the middle of the Germans. So, if we didn't get contact with the guys who came by shore, we'd have a hell of a worse time. What was it like fighting in the hedgerows? It was terrible. They had those guys there in the 88s, I tell you, they're horrible. You don't hear them. They, you hear it the same way when it's thunder and lightning. When the lightning thunders, well, that's all over with. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with the 88. They fired that sucker. 
you're here, it was too late, it's all already gone. And that was a, some weapon, I'll tell you. It was hard because I remember one time General Gavin came and said, What the hell's a hold up? I said, Christ, is an 88 and the machine guns over there, firing like hell. And, and it's hard to, to go over one hedge roll to another. Well, he got mad, and he was a tough little shit, I'll tell you. What did you think of him as a general? Terrific. He was terrific. So we did, we kind of flanked around a little bit when he got the machine guns guys out of the way. and Then we got the 88. He didn't want nobody to hold up. They got to keep moving. So then we uh, went along there again to St. Mary Galice and we, we got to go across this bridge now. Holy Christ. The bridge is only probably 30 feet wide. Oh, Christ. It's going to be a miracle to get across that bridge. These guys are on the other side of the, with machine guns. No, you got to cross it. I just prayed, dear God, that I can get across. I, we, I got across, but we lost a lot of them. You know, we got across, we had not too many. And, uh, and the word come down says we won't have no plane coverage t tomorrow because the Germans capped a couple of our planes. The sheer as hell the next day the Germans came over with our planes scrape, scraping us in a hot, we had a big hospital tent up and they sh shot the shit out of everything. So that afternoon they, they took a prisoner in. And he said that they would have counterattacked us at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So General Gavin says, pass the word down, load up our grenades. And at 3 o'clock, everybody fix their bayonets and take off and scream and holler and throw your grenades in all the holes. And by God, they worked. It scared the shit out of these Germans and they, we pushed them over, <laughs> we pushed them over the hill. So then we had to get relief because we didn't have nobody. I mean, just a few men left to hold the line. So that night, a, a new division came in to relieve us. How many days of combat were you? Did you have? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I got it all down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we come back to secondary defense. So these new kids up there. That time Charlie comes by every night checking. And then these damn kids have tracers in their bullet and their guns. Well it's shit, you can see the whole front line. So about ten minutes later, now here comes a little fighter scraping the shit out of them. So they got all shot to hell. Mm -hmm. Then we have to go back up the front line again. That was terrible really. I went there for, I think, another couple of weeks, and I think we got relieved. Went back to secondary defense. They moved us around quite a bit different spots. And after the, we got all I had done settled, and we crossed the river, And we're fighting from hedgerow to hedgerow. And the engineers kept building this bridge for the pontoons. And the Germans kept knocking them out. Well, we didn't get no more supplies. We ran low on gasoline. We ran very, very low on ammunition. That the Germans only knew. But finally they got built up again. Then we got we got relieved and went back to, we went to, let's see. Yeah, we went back to France, and so so France, living in tents. And we stayed there till we invaded Holland. Now, did you get a lot of replacements in? Oh, yes. While you were there? Oh, yes. I'll tell you the truth. 
I never got to meet all the replacements either. We went back up again and being in the Holland. And most, most majority of the replacements we got all got killed. Now in our market garden, were you, did you land in a glider at that yeah. time? Oh, that was beautiful. We landed right in the cow field. Beautiful. Was that a horse that glider? No, no. Our glider. American glider. It was beautiful. Could you tell us about that in a little more detail? Well, that was a beautiful lane. I mean, it was like a practice run. <laughs> I mean, they were shooting at us, but it was nice. We come down so beautiful in this beautiful big field with a cow there out there pasturing, and it was very nice. So we we landed. We got there. We no. I can't think of the damn name of the city now. We're right on the border of Germany and Belgium. And that's when we got surrounded. We were really there for about, I think, two or three weeks we were surrounded. And the planes came over, dropped over, supplies and stuff, hell, the wind blew it over to the Germans. And we were very lucky. The, the Holland people in the Belgium, they were feeding us. They were helping us. And, what they had in the garden and stuff like that. We're not too far from uh, Nijmegen mm -hmm. at that time. Well, we fought from there all the way up to Ziegfried Line, all in, up, right to the end of the war. We could relieve a little bit, go to secondary defense for a while, and then go back up again, back and forth. Then, when we did get done fighting, they said, that's it, we're going to go home. So we went back to France. We all got passes to go to Paris. We're all packing up, ready to go to Paris. Word comes up, no more pass, everything's transferred, nobody can leave the post. Twelve o'clock that night, the Air Force came, picked us up on the trucks, like cattle, then the Battle of the Balls. Went up to the Battle of the Balls. Snow like cow, cold. Here we are, got summer clothes. And we had to take off our, all our singers, our ranks, and everything, take everything off. So they marched up the front line. We fought here two days. At night, we were draw. They moved to another position. And we fought there a couple of days, and they kept moving around. It was a bitch, I tell you. It was so freaking cold. Did you ever get frostbite at all? Well, you know, it's funny you say that because when I come home from the service, I had trolled my feet. And I went to the doctors and they couldn't, nobody could tell me what the hell was the matter with it. Until about three years ago, I went to hear about my hearing. And I told her, look, I said, I can't afford to buy him. I says, she says, go see Mr. Williams. He was representative of the VA in Hopewell. He can help you. So I went to see him. And he helped me and then he got my record out. I said, oh, you're in the Battle of the Balls. You must be one of those guys that has your feet frozen. So right away he sent me up to a Rochester to see a specialist. And sure as hell my feet were frozen because I have no feelings. They got that little needle and will prick you all over hell. And that's the first time I found out what my problem was. So you just wore the regular shoes and yeah, but didn't regular did you ever, combat boots. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever have many, many changes of socks or anything? Just what we had. Mm -hmm. well, I was very fortunate really, because a lot of boys lost their feet. Mm -hmm. Did you have mittens or gloves at all? No, I had a coat. You sleep at night and you wake up, you're covered with snow. There was no picnic, I'll tell you. See, a lot of people don't understand what the hell went on up there, I'll tell you. How long were you in the bulge the entire time? Yeah. That was a blessing that was over. <laughs> Did you have any kind of shelter at all to protect you from no. the weather? 
to see where we go. No, it wasn't, 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 Where did you go from there? We went back, came back to France. Oh, I skipped, oh no, we've been, uh, oh, I skipped a whole bunch. We're in, uh, we went back to Belgium, Pepinster, Pepin Belgium. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, they gave us all a bill of straw. And we slept there. They gave us each a bill of straw. Well, we stayed there quite a while because it was like in a hollow, a little valley, and he's here. Jim has sent over these there, uh, oh, what the hell do they call them now, jeez. Those missiles. The, the V1s and yes, V2s? Uh, they're getting just enough fuel, because right next where we, where we were staying, they had a dump with fuel and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and they are trying to get that. Mm -hmm. But as long as we were there, they never hit a... But you can never could hear it, but you can see these Belgian people. When they ran for shelter, you know damn well something was coming. coming. And but they, they were a beautiful weapon they had, I tell you. But they, it was so small of an area that it was hard to, for them to pinpoint for that to land there. So we stayed there for, well, I can't remember how long we stayed there. And we, and we moved around quite a bit there, in different areas fighting. You were never wounded? Well, I got hit with a strap on my ass, but I never complained. Because <laughs> you were more safe on the front line than you were back. Because they're shelling the shit on behind. Cause they, and it's all you monkey around in the front line that's most small iron stuff. But, mm -hmm. So I never did go back. It wasn't too bad, so the medics took care of it. And we, it's hard for me to remember all these different places we crossed the different rivers. Because I remember the one river we crossed. Christ, they had tanks and bulldozers making a big commotion on this part of the river. Like we can make a big push across the river to draw the attention of the Germans. So the Germans moved their forces to that area. And we're up further where we crossed the river. And stuff like that, they pull out of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it really worked. <clears throat> so then we finally. God, I don't like it. I can't remember all these friggin' places, really. So you were always on the move, then? Yeah, we never come home till the end of the war. We did that. When things... I'm trying to, We're in a, a age. We're living in a hotel this time. Mm -hmm. We took over a hotel. And, and it was beautiful, really. And we're in secondary defense, and... Did you ever liberate any of the concentration camps? Oh, we had this here. Oh, yeah, quite a few of them this here. Then we took one in. He was from Syria, Greek. He's a Greek guy. And he, was, he claimed he was a millionaire. Boy, he was all bones, I tell you. So we brought him with us. And we had put him in the kitchen. Oh, he thought he died and went to heaven. He begged us to come to see him after the war. But I, don't, I had enough of that stuff. And what did you eat on the move? Mostly uh, K rations? Yeah. <clears throat> I remember I, I got me a big carbuckle one time behind and I, I 
for an invasion of an army, I'll tell you, it's horrible. I was going to sing this girl, and, I, and she told her mother, I said, I'll take care of it for you. What she did, she got a bottle, she heated it. We got it real hot, and it's put it right over time, and it, it stuck it right out. Hmm. Then she went out and got me some color oil. Color oil. Holy Jesus. That was horrible. <laughs> that was horrible to drink. Tablespoon of that stuff. Well, then after the, that war got over, they, they shipped us to Berlin. We occupied Berlin. When I, Eisenhower Strasse, they, they called it. Do you ever have any contact with the Russians? Yeah, them son of a <clears throat> bee, yes. They're horrible. In what ways did you? Well, we met some because uh, we were in one part of Germany there. We were Gardner's Bridge on this side and the Russians on the other side. And uh, I think I got a picture of that someplace. Excuse me a minute. Like on your chest, Wayne can really focus in, even a small one like that. Holy God. Now what, what does that picture show? The Russians. And me and a couple other guys on the side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. They came over with us. They bring the, a big five gallon jug of vodka. And I'll tell you, that vodka is horrible. I think it must have been 150 proof. Could we drop some on the porch? Try to eat the paint right off the porch? <laughs> <laughs> so we had to mix a, a quart to a gallon of orange juice to make it so you could be able to drink it. Mm -hmm. But you didn't care for the Russians? Mostly oh, really? some were good, but I'm a, I'm a uneducated. And what they wanted, they took, like if they saw somebody, the Germans walking down a nice pair of boots or something, they'd take them right away from them. Mm -hmm. And they tried to run, break in our warehouses so many times, because they never had enough to eat. You can put the picture down now. I'd like to see it. Yeah, there's a picture of my wife on the other side. Now, how long were you in the Army of Occupation? Well, <clears throat> I had points to come home a long time, but we wanted, there was Jimmy Avoy and Don Del Living, about five of those guys in around the area. So we'll wait and go home with the division, but a lot of guys were getting killed there. The Russians are shooting a hell of a people. It was crazy, I was like, ah, so. They were shooting the civilians? And no, it was GIs. Oh, really? Like we had a non-con club. They come in, like you see that, they had this gun they, they carry over their neck, and they get drinking, and they get drunk, and they don't give it there. They just feel like we're shooting anybody they feel like shooting. So we figured we better go home. So, November, October, we started the process to come home. And we got home discharged in November, Thanksgiving Day of 45. But we figured we might as well go home before we get killed. So the Russians had killed several GIs then? Oh, they sure did. You know, first they let us carry weapons. And that's we got in a lot of trouble because not everybody shoot each other. Then they, then they, cause see, we had like the United States had this section, mm -hmm. France had that section, Russia had their section, England had their section, so forth. But the Russia always liked to go over to the American side because a lot of we we treat a lot of them real good. We mm -hmm. did because we're very fortunate. Now we had a lot to play to eat and stuff like that. And they didn't have much of anything, really. I felt sorry for them in a way because they didn't have it. Sure. 
it was the people in this country that should see the way those poor kids had to live there. They go eat out of our garbage cans. They get another tin can. They just dig right in the garbage. And a lot of guys who just feel bad, like myself and imagine hundreds of other, they won't eat all their food to get to the kids. It was terrible. It was terrible, really. These people in our country don't know what hell is. Because they never had to suffer. So when did you arrive home? Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. You were discharged right away? Yeah, Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. It's funny, you know, because we're on our way home to Maryland. Oh, buddy said, now look. We'll spend a couple of weeks in New York. <laughs> so we got four dicks. By the time we got went through custom and all that crap. And so now we're getting discharged. <clears throat> so I was the first one got discharged. So all my buddies said, look, but <clears throat> go out and hire a limousine. We're going to go to New York. And tell them, if he gets us in time, they catch the evening tr train, we'll give them an extra 20 bucks. Nobody wanted to stay in New York. Everybody wanted to go home. So we did. We hired a limousine. We got to New York. It was about 10 minutes before the train left. And we got on the train. I give the conductor five bucks to wear home, tell my mother and father I'll be in Syracuse at a certain time. Get in Syracuse and I got out, nobody there. So I called home and I said, what happened? And she said, what do you mean what happened? And she gave my telegram and said, no. Everybody sent a telegram to mother and father and nobody got it. And mm -hmm. so we kept the money. So I swore, well, I'll go to Lions so you can pick me up in Lions. So that's what they did. After you, uh, you got home, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Yes, I, I uh, not right away. Oh, I, my mother said, why do you want to go work right in for him? It's because you're entitled to... 5220 club? Yeah. And I said, no, I, I went back to at the ordinance. I went back to work at the ordinance. And then uh, we had a, I worked with surveillance department. I was, uh, I was a supervisor. We had 85,000 anti-tank mines to blow up. So I went to Fort Drum, Camp Drum, mm -hmm. in Rome, in uh, Watertown, to blow them up. And I had an accident, like a lot of shrapnel on my legs. So I thought I'd break the hell out of that business. So I went back and start baking again. So I worked for Becky and Can Dingle, so I wanted to go to school for cake decorating. I went to New York for six weeks. Then I took a night, night course in agriculture for a couple of years. So I thought I wanted to try farming on the side a little bit. That was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it for about five years and my wife, she was a farmer. She said, I, I married you. I hope to get away from the farm. <laughs> and we're, back to, we're right back there again. So. so I baked most of my life. And, uh, Did you work for, for yourself? or for? Well, I, worked, I ran a bakery for 16 years for a friend of mine. I bought one. Then I'm working part-time for another baker here in Geneva. And uh, so finally he, he came to my house one Saturday morning. Well, I don't know if I want to buy this business. I said, hell yes, I, I bought this business. So I had that for about 16 years and they tore my building down in the plaza right here. So I tried to move another part of the plaza. Well, hell, I was paying 500 plus. Now they raised it to 1,500 plus. And I said, you're going to be crazy. God, give me two hands. How much can I do? Two hands, you know. Mm -hmm. So I quit and I said, oh, no, hell, 
I just had an auction, sold everything off, and I tried to retire. I couldn't. Jesus. So Hobart here had to end up paid for a baker. And I was selling big goods, and I knew the people real well. So he wants somebody to run the bakery. So I went over. They hired me. So I was in heaven. I was the guy. I'm sorry I didn't do that in the beginning because I was making more money and less hours and no headaches. I had so many people stealing from me and stuff like that. This way I was off on weekends and had my summers off. I'd go to once in a while because they have a lot of camps to like lacrosse and so on and so forth. I used to make a lot of brownies and stuff, put in the freezer for them and that's all. You know, like first time in my life I ever collected unemployment. Then I went to, I got worried if it's going to interfere with my Social Security. He said, hell no, you can collect Social Security at the same time if you want. So <laughs> I was making more money going fishing <laughs> and not working, really. That was amazing, really. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yeah, I'm a life member of the VA, I mean, the VFW and the American Legion, I'm a member. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Yeah, I just one who left, Sergeant Nelson. He was in Chicago. So I went to a seminar up here in, in Buffalo, cool, a long time ago. Only three men with my company were there. Most and, of them were all dead. And you also stayed in contact with that English family. Yeah, they're, they're, you said, they're, yeah no yes. more now. They're, they're all dead. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in the service changed and had an effect on your life? Well, for a while it was hell. I had some bad dreams. But I made a better person, I mean. Made me more appreciative. It's great to be living in America. People don't realize what it is. To be free, really. Mm -hmm. Across the camera. Here's, uh, if you could hold these up like you did the other one and just talk about where and when that was taken and a little bit about it. Well, this one here is, take, this one here is taken in a frames. So, so in frames. It's just outside of rings. Now, were with you with the 82nd Airborne at that time? I know oh, you're yeah. still wearing the 101st patch, though. Well, we never took them off. Well, you always carried the... Let's see now. Didn't I have that marked on it? Yes, I think it says France 44. That's been one of my old shirts, then. Mm-hmm. Now this fellow here, this guy here, he lost his ankles in the base of Normandy. He was going through this field. They had these pen, like tent pegs. You couldn't see them. So when you walk and you hit that, it would blow off your feet. Mm -hmm. about that one? That's in Berlin. This is the after the war. Occupation of Berlin. Now when were you promoted to sergeant? After the invasion of Normandy. Okay. You could have been a lieutenant if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want that. Because uh, Sergeant, you're in the middle. You don't get too much flack, and <clears throat> you have responsibilities, but not great. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd rather just keep that. And okay. Now this is a, a series of pictures.
that's the word just well this one here is in England that's in France they tell you we were too far from Nancy France I came I can't remember what this was but these were in France here in Soissons mm -hmm. France now what what is that uh, German aircraft there? <clears throat> That's one of the unfortunate ones that we shot down. France and these were the Belgium we were fighting us and we lived in the cellars. That's what I say about the 88. We had one come through one side to the other side and never went off. Wow. We we're lucky to break one of Yes. Okay. Okay. Well thank you very much for your interview. Well you're more than welcome. And that was taken in 1991, you said, or 93? 94. 94. In June, 94. Okay. Okay. Great.